Welcome everyone to this UW Medicine Town Hall about the COVID vaccine. My name is Yvonne Simpson. I'm with Harborview Medical Center and I'm very delighted to have you all join us. Uh, this uh, town hall is going to be uh, led in part by Dr. Janelle Stewart, who's going to be sharing with us some information about the COVID vaccine and who will also be taking your questions. Um, all of the information that we have is accurate and up to date as of today, March 2nd, uh, 2021. We know all of this information keeps evolving and changing over time. And um, uh, this information or this uh, event will also be recorded and can be rewatched at a later date. Uh, so if you would like to see it again, or if you would like to, um, uh, share the information with anybody else, you can as well. Um, we also uh, have with us uh, Chantal Cayo, uh, also with UW Medicine. And um, so uh, Chantal and Janelle will both be sharing uh, information with us this evening. I will be monitoring uh, the chat. So if you have questions, you are welcome to put that into the chat and uh, we will try to answer as many as we can at the end. Um, all right, thank you very much. I will hand it over to Janelle and Chantal. That has a nice ring to it, Janelle and Chantel. Um, Chantel, did you wanna go first or do you want me to just jump straight into it? Go ahead and jump straight into it. Hi everyone, I'm Chantal Kyer. I'm the uh, Chief Nursing Officer for UW Medicine Primary Care. And I'm glad to be here tonight to help answer any questions you may have. Go ahead, Janelle. Great. I'm Dr. Janelle Stewart. I'm an infectious diseases physician at University of Washington. I primarily see patients at Harborview Medical Center, um, and I'm excited to see you all here tonight and looking forward to answering all your questions. Uh, before we get started, you know, just as Yvonne mentioned, things are evolving every day. So I'm going to try to give you a quick snapshot of where we are right now on March 2nd. Um, to give you a little bit of information about availability of vaccines, safety of vaccines, um, and any potential concerns or side effects, and if and the efficacy, how well they work. Um, and then from there, we can jump into any questions you have. So as of today, there are three vaccines available in the United States. We have the um, two mRNA vaccines, Moderna and Pfizer, and then Johnson & Johnson vaccine just became available this week. Right now in King County, and keep in mind that every county is a little bit different um, and it's all being rolled out at a county level. So King County, if you're over 65, you can sign up. If you are over 50 and you live in a house with two other generations, so you have grandkids and grandparents in the same house, you can sign up for a vaccine. And I just saw a breaking news come out of Seattle Times that the federal government is pushing for teachers and caregivers um, to get child caregivers to get vaccinated as soon as possible. I don't have any more details about this change in the eligibility, but I anticipate that King County will release a statement later tonight or tomorrow about anyone who's a teacher or a child care provider and how quickly they can sign up. But that's great news. Um, let's see. So that's who's eligible. And then the best way to sign up is to go online. Unfortunately, doctor's offices don't have vaccines right now. Mostly it's being done out of central locations. Um, and that's the phase finder um, at washington.gov is gonna be the best way to sign up online. So a little bit of basic information about safety and how well it works. So the great news is, is that all three of these options are very safe. We've now seen millions of people get the mRNA vaccines. And I know a lot of people are really nervous about that technology because these are the first mRNA vaccines to become available but they've been in development for a really long time, almost a decade. Uh, and because of the way that technology works, they were able to substitute out um, the virus they were working on before and put in the COVID-19 virus. And so it's new to the market, but technology that they've been working on for a long time, millions of people have gotten that and there've been no major side effects. 
I will say if you had a re bad reaction to a vaccine before, you're going to want to talk to your doctor about whether or not you should get the vaccine because some people do have allergies to the mRNA vaccines. Um, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is also very safe. Uh, not as many people have gotten that, but the data has been pretty convincing from the trials that there are no safety concerns with that one as well. That one's different in that it's only a single dose. Um, so it's gonna be even easier to complete your vaccine series with the Johnson Johnson vaccine. All right, let's talk about whether or not they work. So all three of these work. The data coming out, you're seeing numbers like 94%, 95%, 66%. And I would say the takeaway for me in comparing these vaccines is that 60 days after you're done getting vaccinated, all of them prevent you from getting hospitalized, up to 100% effective. So you might see different numbers at different time points, but given enough time for your body to make antibodies, they're very, very, very effective at keeping you out of the hospital. What we don't know yet is whether or not it will prevent you from spreading the virus around. You might still have a small amount of virus in your nose um, and you could still spread it to other people who aren't vaccinated. So that's why you're seeing things about still wearing a mask, um, hand washing and keeping distance even after getting vaccinated. That's not gonna last forever, um, but until more and more people are vaccinated, that's gonna be important to keep other people safe. All right, that was a whirlwind of basic information about the vaccines available. I'm gonna pause there and have Chantel give any additional information I forgot to share or let other people ask questions. Thank you, Janelle. Well, maybe I'll just throw out some questions there that you can help clarify for the group. So you talked about um, how safe and how effective they are. So the people are number people, they are visual people. So Johnson & Johnson is, is claiming 76 or 70 so percent effectiveness versus the Moderna and the Pfizer 90, 95, 96%. So, what is your recommendation? If I had the choice of all three, which ones should I get? Great question. Um, and this is a question I just talked to my mother-in-law about last night. It's a very common question. Um, the answer is whichever one you can get first is the best possible vaccine. They all work really well. Um, we're trained to be concerning consumers. You know, which cereal is the best cereal for me? Which shampoo is the best shampoo? Uh, vaccines are not a time to, uh, to draw those fine lines. It's re really whichever one you can get first is going to be the best one. And like I said, and the reason I feel comfortable telling that to you and to my family is because with time, they're all extremely effective. None of them are a bad choice. Great. Thank you. So does the Johnson & Johnson work on MRA as well, or that's a DNA? Uh, it's a little bit different. So let me just explain what mRNA vaccines are. It's a messenger RNA. So it's a coded message that it sends to your body. It's like an old school spy movie. And it sends this message and your cells get the message and it starts photocopying it and making antibodies to attack the virus without ever having seen the virus, just a message describing it. And it's a really detailed description. So it's delicate. That's why it needs to be frozen. That's why um, it can only be out of the freezer for so long because it's a really detailed long message. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine is, what they did was they took a cold virus and they um, just used the shell of it. So it's not something that can get you sick at all. It's just a piece of it to help get it into your body and help you make antibodies to it. But it's a simpler message that, um, that helps you make antibodies to the same virus. And because it's simpler, it doesn't need to be in the freezer. And so that one can be stored for longer. Right. I hope that makes sense. Yes, thank you. I didn't know that about the Johnson & Johnson. That's good to know. So. Still staying on that route. Um, I've even heard this personally among family and friends. They're afraid to get the vaccine because um, I've heard it will alter my genetic code. Can you talk about that? Can you talk about, you know, yes, these vaccines were made in what people 
think is a rushed manner, but um, can you talk about that and, and about the altering of the genetic code? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. You know, um, I am a nerd. And so I went and looked at all of the papers I could find to understand this because I hadn't seen an mRNA vaccine and I wanted to understand how it worked. I think the most reassuring thing for me about an mRNA vaccine, like I just described, it's a message. So once it delivers the message to your cells, it's a self-destructing message. It disappears. It doesn't hang out in your body. Your body just remembers what to do and keeps making those antibodies. But the vaccine doesn't hang around. Um, once it delivers the message, it dissolves. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is, think, is the most reassuring piece of information for understanding why it won't incorporate, um, mostly because it dissolves as soon as the message is delivered. There's a couple other really nerdy things about how it's RNA and not DNA. And so it can't really incorporate because um, they're different. Um, but I think the big takeaway is that once the message is delivered, it dissolves. Great, that's good to know. We have a question here from Ella. Uh, is there plans on making the Johnson & Johnson vaccine a two dose vaccine schedule? Have you heard Great of Great question. That? Yeah, it, right now. The efficacy. Go, yeah, two, go ahead, Chantel. You're talking about the efficacy concerns with that one. If you got two vax, if you got two doses, would it improve the efficacy? The seventy percent would would it improve the number? Yeah, that's a great question, and I wouldn't be surprised if a year from now they're offering boosters for multiple types of vaccines because of variants that are coming around, and we can talk more about variants as well because that's a common question. Mm -hmm. um, but. I'm really reassured by the 60 day information from the Johnson Johnson trial that 60 days after a single dose, it was 100% effective at keeping people out of the hospital. So while those initial numbers are not as good as the mRNA vaccine, I think it just takes a little bit longer for that message to be fully delivered to your immune system it's very effective. So right now I wouldn't bother with a second dose if it were up to me. Um, but if there were boosters in the future, I would suspect it would be um, surrounding variants. Thank you. Okay. Um, so if you could talk about the variants cause that's been all over the news and it's been, it's here in Washington. So what can you tell us about it and how can we keep ourselves safe? Yeah. Um, so Viruses are constantly changing and replicating. Um, since the beginning of this pandemic a year ago now, um, there have been thousands and thousands of different variants and it doesn't matter. Um, sometimes it folds in a different way and it doesn't do anything different. But sometimes the virus folds in a new way that makes it a little stickier. Um, and so when it finds your nose, a smaller amount of virus can get you sick. Um, and you don't need as many viruses um, as a different shape uh, would uh, need before. So that the variant that first was described in the UK and the variant that was first described in South Africa, they're a little bit stickier. So when it comes to vaccines, the great news is they still work. Um, the hesitancy that I have is that I think it just takes a little bit longer for your body to get it under control when it's so sticky. So that's why I thought that there might be boosters in the future because of variants, but I would still anticipate, and this is what we've seen from vaccine trials in the UK and from South Africa, that it still works very well to control the virus. It just takes a little bit longer. So you might have a little bit more symptoms, sniffles, headache, things like that. Um, but I would still anticipate the vaccine would keep people out of the hospital. Great. And if I had COVID previously, should I get the vaccine or am I immune? Another great question. Um, you should definitely get the vaccine. Um, after you get COVID, you develop antibodies, but they just don't last as long as after a vaccine. After a natural COVID infection, um, most people lose their antibodies after about 60 days. So you're gonna wanna get that vaccine for more lasting immunity. Great, thank you. Um... Another question, let me see if there's anything in the chat. Nothing in the chat, okay. What is the normal flu vaccine efficacy? Ooh, great 
question. And this is a complicated topic that comes up a lot because it sounds like we have some smart audience members who know that year to year, the flu vaccine doesn't always work that well. Um, and that's because, that's because um, the, I think the best way to explain that is because we deal with variants all the time with influenza. And so they're always guessing ahead of time what variants are going to be the ones that come to Seattle and which vaccine we should give you. And so sometimes they guess wrong and they guess it's going to be a B type with certain proteins on it and it ends up being more of an A type with different proteins and so it misses. So I can't answer that question with a number because it changes every year. I think the good news is that with influenza every year we have different targets. With COVID-19 we still have that one same spike protein target that remains the target. So that's really great news for vaccine efficacy going forward. It's not as much of a guessing game as it is with influenza. Here's another question. Are there predictions on how long vaccine effectiveness will stay in place? That's a great question. No one knows the answer to that one yet. Um, and that's because uh, we've only had the, these vaccines in the arms of people for uh, almost, I think the earliest data is gonna be about a year out now. Um, and so we know that it's probably gonna last at least a year. Um, and I'm guessing it's gonna last longer than that, but we just don't know yet. And is it a good idea to do blood tests for antibodies before being vaccinated? Oh, great question. I would say no, um, don't waste your time and money on testing for antibodies. And that's because that gets back to what I was talking about, about your natural immunity not lasting as long and how you'd still want a vaccine anyway. Um, and keep in mind that the blood test you get for antibodies is a slightly different, depending on how the lab measures it, it will measure a slightly different antibody uh, than the ones that your body makes after the vaccine, only because of the, the way that we find the antibodies with the tests but they're still effective, but the ones from a natural infection just don't last as long. So don't waste your time and money with antibody tests. Good, good, good answer. Um, so I was at a vaccination clinic this weekend and it was the Moderna vaccine. And one of the patients asked me, um, now that I've gotten my first dose, this was first dose, um, but can I socialize with someone who has their two doses already? What is the answer? Yeah, good question. Um, and I think we're all so eager for life to be different than it is right now. Um, and I wish that I could say that there would be a day in the future where all of a sudden everything will be different. And I think it's going to be a lot more gradual and slow than that. So after you're vaccinated, your body doesn't have full immunity for a couple more weeks after your second dose. And all that that means is that you are protected from ending up in the hospital. Mm -hmm. But I, I can't tell you with certainty that you won't spread the virus around. So it depends on people's bubbles. Uh, I think that's a term people use a lot or who is in your network, who's in your community. So if I'm vaccinated um, and I have a friend who's vaccinated and we're hanging out, but I don't realize I have COVID in my nose, uh, my friend might pass COVID on to her partner. Um, and so I could be contributing to getting someone else sick, um, mm -hmm. even though we're both vaccinated. So once you're vaccinated, your risk of transmission goes way, way down. You're way less likely to give it to someone else, but it's not zero. So until we have probably at least 70% of the population vaccinated, you should continue to be really cautious to prevent the spread around town. Another question, um, I think Europe is planning on having vaccination passports. Do you know if that's going to be something for the US? Yeah, great question. I don't know what the policy de decision will be for the US. I would be surprised, um, but um, time, will, time will tell what happens with policy. The US currently um, requires a negative COVID test to fly into the US right now. Um, and so that's the closest thing to that policy that exists right now. 
Yeah, we don't know if they're going to uh, require vaccination yet because right. number one, exactly. the supply is, is so unstable. So I, right. I think it would be a hindrance to require it right now for anyone. And that would be atypical for the United States to require a vaccine. Usually we're a nation that really promotes um, access to things, but requiring things is not a typical American policy. I know that Greece has opened um, their borders specifically to people with vaccines. So um, and try to increase tourism. So we'll see certain nations adopting different policies. Yeah, I saw on the news there's a cruise ship that um... World Caribbean, I think, is launching a cruise that's only open to Israeli residents because they're they're the model child for vaccination, Israel, and that um, they everyone has to be vaccinated in order to get on that cruise ship. So interesting. Yeah, a colleague um, of mine was advocating to help local restaurants by having only vaccinated people come to the restaurants, um, which is an interesting idea. But very interesting. Yeah, it's a little <laughs> me to endorse that one yet. <laughs> oh, yeah. So um, Ben Black here wrote, so um, I guess there's a question about um, whether this is truly in the sense of the word a vaccine, because he's saying from the scientific term, it's not really a vaccine because of the mechanism that it operates. Could you talk about that? Oh, interesting point, Ben. Um, I would say that in a modern sense of vaccine, in that you um, have a piece of information about the infection and then your body makes antibodies against it that I would definitely still classify it as a vaccine. Um, the piece of information has changed. In this case, it's mRNA. Usually it's little bits of protein, um, but either way, it's a little piece of information about what the target is and then your body does the hard work and makes the antibodies. Which reminds me, I did wanna to touch on expected side effects after getting the vaccine. A lot of people have concerns about how people have felt after getting vaccinated. So I wanna make sure to address that. Um, with, especially after the second dose, your, your immune system is really getting revved up and doing its job and making antibodies. And so for some people, they might feel tired while their body is making a lot of antibodies. For other people, they might have a headache. Um, I had a headache for about a, a day and a half after my second dose, and then I felt totally fine and great, um, which is way better than having COVID in my opinion. Um, and some people have um, some fevers and chills. You can take Tylenol um, and it, everybody's symptoms goes away within 36 hours. And that is expected that you'll have some sort of response because your immune system is making so many antibodies. But it's not because you're sick with COVID, it's just because your immune system is doing a good job making antibodies. Yeah, I would say I received my two doses and I didn't have, the side effect that I had was a sore arm for both. And then um, after my second dose, Maybe the next day I felt a little tired. My eyes were heavy. I just went to bed early. Next day I woke up, I was fine. So um, Ben is also commenting, uh, there are too many unanswered questions and areas of concerns for me to consider receiving a risky and, and experimental therapy for an illness that is for most mild and quickly resolves itself without requiring medical treatment. I don't know. That was just a comment or if there's a question there, Ben. Yeah, I can respond to that comment, Ben. Ben, I hear you. Um, I know that getting vaccines, especially when they're newer vaccines, uh, makes people want to see uh, time pass and see other people get those vaccines first to make sure that it's okay. I'm reassured that millions of people have gotten vaccines and have done really well. And Part of it, you know, I'm talking about how you expect to have some side effects after it, and not everyone has a lot of symptoms with COVID. So part of my inspiration for vaccinations is not just for myself, but for my community, because the faster we have a lot of people vaccinated, the faster we can get the pandemic under control and keep people out of the hospital, even though I know that I am unlikely to end up in the hospital myself, I want to protect other people. So that's just a little bit of my own inspiration, but I hear you, Ben. Um, and let me know if you have specific questions um, that or concerns. I'm happy to address those. So I have a question from Ella. Um, can you give how many folks were vaccinated so far in the U.S. 
and in the state of Washington. I know for the state of Washington, I heard it on the news this morning, I think it's 1.3 million. I'm not, uh, that's about, I think that's what I remember what I heard this morning. Yeah, I, I wish I could tell you that number off the top of my head. I know it's in the millions. Um, I think that in the United States as a whole, 15% of the population has received at least one dose. So um, I, you'd have to do the math, math yeah. based on the latest census for how many people that is. But we still have a ways to go until our target of having at least 70% vaccinated. Um, so jumping to Ella's question. So, um, then how many severe side effects noted? I don't know if we have that number. I don't know. Yeah, the CDC is, um, developed an app. And so I know myself and a lot of people who have been vaccinated get a text message every week asking how I'm doing and what my side effects are. And they're doing a really good job of keeping track of any small side effect. Um, and so far, what I've seen is that it's very safe. Um, we've seen very, very few anaphylaxis, and that's been the big concern is people having allergic reactions. Um, that's why I mentioned if you've had allergies to vaccines like yellow fever vaccine before, that you're going to want to talk to your doctor first. Um, but that's been very, very rare. I don't have hard numbers for you, but it's been um, even more rare than we thought it might be. And they also have been tracking um, pregnant women getting vaccinated to look at any potential miscarriages, um, stillbirths, um, preeclampsia, any potential bad outcome surrounding pregnancy. And the numbers are very reassuring so far that pregnant women have done well with the vaccine. So those numbers are being generated. Um, they're becoming more and more available. Uh, but I would say so far, very reassuring. The rates are very low of any side effects, aside from what Chantelle and I were talking about with feeling tired or having a little bit of a headache the day after your vaccine. Um, when will we have more availability in Washington state? I can speak a little bit to that. I sit on the vaccine rollout committee and it varies week to week, unfortunately. Um, the supply is, is very unstable. Um, we don't know, we, we put it in order and what we get may be half of that or a third of that is what I'm, what I'm finding out. So yes, it's a very slow and um, arduous process. And yeah, yeah, totally get it. But yeah, I don't know if you can speak to any on vaccine availability. No, I, I, it's the same information you have in that we hope for a certain number of doses each week. Um, but it's hard to know what we're going to get because it's happening on such a large scale because this is impacting the whole world. Um, so I'm very optimistic that it will continue to get better, um, but I am also realistic that it, it's going to continue to be uh, slower than we want it to be. Can you talk about how Black and Brown communities are more likely to be infected and die from COVID? Yeah, this is a really important topic. Um, it, we have seen this over and over, and I, I think this is, you know, COVID is shining a light on the issues in our society, and we are dealing with some pretty serious racism in this country, um, especially at a structural level. Um, and so you're going to see COVID impacting those communities who are impacted by structural racism more. Um, and I, I could come up with conversations about comorbidities or essential workers, but I, I don't think that does it justice um, when I really do think that it comes down to structural racism. So I think it's another indicator that we need to do better as a society uh, to uh, improve health equity in our nation. So in I know at Harborview, we're working hard to try to improve vaccine access, specifically for communities and zip codes that have been more impacted by COVID. And I think you're going to see those efforts more uh, with some of the larger rollout uh, in Auburn and Kent uh, this week. They've opened larger um, vaccine sites to try to improve access in those communities specifically. Um, but we've got a lot of work to do to address this issue. Um, it seems as though the UK government is expecting vaccines to cause impairments and disability 
and they have structured a compensation program. Um, have you heard anything about this and why has the US not done this? I have not heard anything about this. This has not been on the news at all. No, I haven't heard about that. So I, I can't comment. Yeah. But I, I will read up on it. So um, I, my, my mother lives in New York State and they opened up um, vaccine eligibility to those 65 and older and also those with comorbidities of any age. So they just opened the floodgates in my opinion. So mm -hmm. can you talk about um, what, what comorbidities should, should one not get? If you have a certain comorbidity, who should not get the vaccine at this time? I, I can say at the um, vaccination clinic I was at this weekend, we had a lot of transplant um, patients. Um, if you're three or four years out of a transplant, I would think that that would be okay. But if, what if you're within the six, seven months of just getting a, a, a new organ? That's a, you know, I think that because everyone's situation is so unique, I think when it comes to people whose immune systems aren't as strong as a normal immune system, for whatever reason, um, that's going to be an individual conversation with your provider to discuss your situation and your immune system. So I don't want to give a blanket statement about who should or shouldn't, because I really do think when it comes to um, someone with an immune system that's not as strong, that that should be a conversation with your provider. because. I think it's going to be important for those people to get vaccinated to get that protection, um, but that you want to make sure you get the timing right and your doctor can help with that. So those with weakened immune systems for whatever reason should consult with their yep. treating physician. Yep, and people with um, severe allergies, um, your um, and not seasonal allergies, but like random anaphylaxis. Um, those are, again, people who are going to want to talk to their doctors. But for the most part, there are very few people that I would say should avoid getting vaccinated. Um, as soon as you are eligible, um, you should be thinking about signing up. Mm -hmm. um, what is the opinion on stretching out the second dose? So right now we're looking at maybe a four week interval to when you're getting your first and second dose. And some people are stretching out six to eight weeks. What, what is your thought on that? Or what's the recommendation? Yeah, you know, I don't have a lot of concerns about waiting to get that second dose. Um, you know, Pfizer, it's uh, three weeks after. For Moderna, it's four weeks after. For Johnson & Johnson, it's zero, one dose and you're done. Um, and I think for uh, Moderna and Pfizer, first of all, let me say that if you get Moderna first, you're going to want to get Moderna second. Um, I, I do not recommend mixing and matching just because we don't have a lot of evidence that that will work. They are doing trials to see if that will work, um, mm -hmm. but we don't have evidence yet. So stick with the first one you got. And, you know, we have seen this with many other vaccines. I'd say the closest vaccine that we have to um, the mRNA vaccines is going to be the hepatitis B vaccine. And you can give someone that second dose much later and it's still very effective. Um, I wouldn't recommend getting it earlier, but even if you miss your appointment or it's getting pushed back, I wouldn't stress too much. Just get in when you can. Thank you. Um, will providers send messages out to those who are eligible to seek out vaccine appointments? I can tell you from a UW standpoint, uh, we are actually, our system of notification, of notifying people is through um, email and yeah, our basic is email and um, mailings, which is not ideal because we understand that um, there are people who don't have an email, who don't have access to the internet. So it's not ideal. Um, I would just recommend people listen to the news for the eligibility. Um, that's always broadcast at least three or four times a day. And also call your doctor's office, even though they're going to hate me. <laughs> call your doctor's office and find out, you know, if they're getting the vaccine or if they know anything about it. If, if you don't have access to email or the internet and things like that. Yeah, I, unfortunately, I, I wouldn't rely on your doctor's office yeah, to contact you before you contact them. It's possible that they might con contact you, and that's great, um, but I would definitely advocate for yourself in this time and um, be persistent with signing up online and checking over and over and 
Um, and if you don't have access to regular internet, you know, there's um, numbers you can call. Um, so there are multiple ways to sign up. Um, the, the easiest way is to sign up online though. Thank you. Um, but the news is in English. What about elders whose native tongue is not English? So I can speak for the Spanish language community. My, my mother is, is, um, is Hispanic and she just watches the Spanish news and they are good about broadcasting eligibility and where to get vaccines and what's going on. The other um, languages in the community, I think they would have to rely on their, their community resources and, and the community at large. We at UW are trying to get out the message in all the language that we have found that, that are that are predominant among our patient populations. I can't speak for the state as a whole. I don't know if you want to Yeah, I this oh Yvonne, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, again, this is uh, specific to UW Medicine, um, but we've been holding town halls like this one in a number of different languages. We're trying um, to get that information out to the public so that they can either participate live um, or so that they can watch it afterwards. And we actually have a UW Medicine YouTube channel about community conversations uh, where uh, folks can go back and watch it, either watch it again or watch it another time. Anyhow, we've done it in a number of languages and uh, we're continuing to try to do as many of those as we can and meet as many communi uh, communities as we can. And I know that uh, King County Public Health also is doing a lot of uh, outreach, uh, particularly to immigrant and refugee uh, communities communities who speak languages other than English. So certainly can't speak for everybody, uh, but there are um, some, some groups who really are trying to be proactive about working with those communities. So I'm really glad that you asked that question, Ella. Great question. Any other questions? I think I'm out of questions. <laughs> um, can you share the links in the chat about also the phone number? Definitely. I will do that. Thanks, Yvonne. Anyone else? Um, I'm just trying to look through our frequent asked questions. Can you talk a little bit about herd immunity? We've heard about that, but I haven't heard much about it for a little bit. Yeah, so herd immunity is, it, it differs from infection to infection and it depends on how infectious it is. So for measles, which is incredibly infectious, we need a high level of herd immunity to prevent big outbreaks. Um, and that's what the goal is. The goal is to prevent big outbreaks. Um, and so you have to be in the 90s to prevent big outbreaks of measles. For COVID, I've seen numbers that go anywhere from 70% to about 85% um, of herd immunity needed to prevent these big outbreaks. I think that once we get to that point, I, the goal and the hope will be that there won't be these big outbreaks that life will feel a little bit more um, normal or how it was a, a year ago once we've reached that point where most people in the community uh, have some immunity. So that's what, what the concept is about herd immunity. Um, I don't know, I, I, there's been a lot of conversation early in the pandemic about um, trying to get herd immunity naturally, um, which as I was talking about earlier, you know, when you naturally get COVID, um, your antibodies don't last that long. So the ideas about getting herd immunity with it just letting COVID work its way through the community is not gonna be very effective um, because you're not gonna have those antibodies lasting long enough to really prevent uh, outbreaks coming up over and over again. Thank you. Uh, also about other vaccines that are due to be soon approved. Have you heard of anything besides Johnson & Johnson, Moderna, and Pfizer? Yeah, there are, there are so many vaccines. Um, there are, um, there's Novavax that is being uh, investigated at University of Washington and a number of other U.S. sites right now. Um, and so that is another potential vaccine that uh, stay tuned for what those efficacy numbers look like. Um, the, in the UK, they developed one called AstraZeneca uh, and that one is being distributed um, throughout the world. We don't have that one in the US. Uh, and then Russia developed the Sputnik uh, vaccine uh, without 
much evidence at first, but now we can see that that vaccine does work pretty well. Um, and then there are a number of vaccines being developed in China as well. But I haven't seen any data on how well those ones work yet. Can a breastfeeding mother have, I guess, the vaccine and, and, pass, the, and pass, I guess, the antibodies onto her baby? Is that your question, Mohammed and Hinda? Or is it, can the breastfeeding mom have COVID? Oh, okay. Can the breastfeeding mom get the vaccine and pass the antibodies onto her baby? Oh, that's a great question. Um, well, first of all, let me address um, pregnancy and breastfeeding. Um, we don't have a ton of data, but early data suggests that it's safe. Um, and, uh, and so I, it's okay for uh, people who are breastfeeding or pregnant to get the vaccine. Uh, if you're pregnant, you're gonna wanna avoid getting a fever. So avoiding getting COVID is gonna be important. Um, and then if you get the vaccine, um, you're gonna uh, be cautious about avoiding fevers and talking to your doctor if you have additional concerns about your pregnancy. Mm -hmm. For the antibodies being passed on in breastfeeding, I would imagine yes, but I don't know. Um, that's a great question. Um, and I don't know that I've seen any papers on that yet. So great question, but I, I, unfortunately, I don't have any uh, data to support that. Um, if I've had the vaccine, the full doses, two doses or the one dose J and J, um, if I'm exposed to COVID, do I need to quarantine? Ooh, good question. I don't know if the policy has been updated yet. Do you know, Chantel? No, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, right now there's just a blanket recommendation for if you've been exposed to wait at home for 14 days or seven days and then get tested um, and make sure you're negative and you don't have symptoms. I think that those recommendations are still in place for people who have been vaccinated, but I anticipate that that might change soon. Um, so stay tuned for more recommendations. Any other questions? I'm, I'm all out of questions. <laughs> Any other questions for, for Janelle or Yvonne or myself? I have one if you'd be willing to address because this uh, question has popped up in a number of communities and uh, it kind of goes along with mom and baby and breastfeeding as well as going along with the question regarding um, changes to DNA. Uh, can you address whether or not or how uh, this vaccine could potentially cause infertility? Um, because that's one of the things that I'm hearing places people don't want to get it because they're afraid that it's going to cause infertility. That's an interesting one. And I haven't heard concerns about infertility coming up before. Um, there, it, fertility is a very complex topic. And there are so many things that can contribute to whether or not you're able to conceive. Um, vaccinations have not historically been linked to issues with fertility. HPV vaccine would prevent cervical cancer, so that would improve fertility. But other than that, there's no direct correlation in my mind between vaccines and fertility. Um, and I can't think of any reason that if I had concerns about fertility that I would avoid getting the vaccine. So um, it, it, I actually, I would say if you're trying to get pregnant, um, getting vaccinated is gonna be really important to protect you um, during a pregnancy. Yeah, thanks. I, yeah, that's been popping up in, in a number of uh, communities. And so thank you for addressing that. Yeah. Someone raising a hand? Oh, yes. Intale? Sorry, I was muted, but thank you for, uh, I'm happy to be here and thank you for y'all for doing this. I have a particular question about, uh, uh, I don't know how to say it, but the ingredients or the materials used in vaccines. I know there's been a lot of misinformation about, like that I've heard that like, uh, that uh, vaccines contain certain substances like pork that might prevent certain communities from, uh, from uh, you know, from uh, taking having them, so like I guess it would be really good for me to be able to tell like uh, certain communities, like you know, what's in the vaccines that these materials are safe and that like there's nothing that there's nothing in the vaccine that would uh, transgress uh, any religious or uh, 
uh, or like religious or just like cultural, uh, uh, what is it, transgressions, like lines per se? That's a great question. Thank you so much, Ntali. Um, yeah, you know, it's, that's a frequent question I get about all vaccines, you know, what else is in there? What are the adjuvants? Um, there, there are no, to specifically to address the concern about pork products, no involvement of pork products and the vaccines. Some vaccines um, use uh, chicken eggs. Um, this is not a vaccine that uses chicken eggs. So there's no um, chicken uh, or egg involvement in these uh, vaccines. Um, the only vaccine that I have detailed information about the adjuvant on is the new Novavax one. And that is actually uh, a chemical compound that is uh, derived from trees in the Amazon. And so it's just, um, you know, usually that's the sort of thing that's in there are um, different things to stabilize that message I was talking about that's being delivered to your cells. You wanna keep that message clear and unscrambled. And so there are certain adjuvants or things that are added to vaccines to stabilize those messages or the proteins. Um, but nothing in the three current uh, vaccines that would um, involve uh, pork products or beef products or chicken products. Um, or other or mercury, that is a question that comes up a lot, no mercury involved in stabilizing this vaccine. Perfect, thank you so much. Yeah. Any other questions? I hope I was able to give you guys some more information. I know this is changing every day and there's always a new news article about vaccines. And, um, and so if you have any other concerns that have come up outside of the news, especially on social media or your, things your friends have said, I'm happy to try to address those. All right. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, All right. Well, yeah, thank you so much. Thanks so much, Danelle. And thank you so much, Chantal, for being here and for leading us through this talk. Um, thank you very much uh, to all of you who've come and participated, who've listened, who asked questions. Um, we're very, very appreciative of this. And uh, yeah, I did put in the chat the link to the YouTube um, channel uh, with the playlist that has all of uh, these uh, recorded videos um, and has uh, previous ones that we've done in a number of languages. So please uh, feel free to take a look at that. I also put in the chat a link to some resources compiled by Ethnomed. And uh, these are resources in many languages. Um, and these have been made available from uh, organizations across the United States. So if you uh, have any interest in looking at other materials or finding things in particular languages, you are very welcome to. All right, and with that, uh, we thank you very much and we uh, please have a very good night. Goodbye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thanks for your questions. Good luck signing up. Thank you, Martin. This is Ella. Can you email me the link to this recording so then I can share it out? Thank um, you. That will be made available uh, probably in a couple of days. So we'll make sure Martin has that to send it out. Awesome. Thank you. You guys have a great night.